So here we're talking about the collective unconscious as it was coming up in about 1600 BC. Okay, because Job, um, the events of Job occurred about then, as near as we can tell. I mean, according to oral tradition, Job lived about the 16th or 17th century BCE. You mean the oral Torah? Well, the oral tradition of Job, okay, but... In the the scriptures. Right, but the scripture of Job, the book of Job, wasn't written until about the 6th century B.C. Okay. So, in other words, this stuff was working through the collective unconscious uh, for a thousand years, okay? And what we're seeing is the human psyche evolving Okay, and and keeping in mind that Jung and Edinger were staying away from the metaphysical God. Okay, so they were saying, we're not saying anything. I mean, obviously they were because everything unconscious and everything in the psyche is also metaphysical. <laughs> is it not? I mean, is everything in the psyche metaphysical? Metaphysics is a posturing, I don't know. Well, I mean, metaphysical means it's not physical, right? And and so it's 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 somewhere in here, or in here, or wherever it is, but it's not something that you can put your finger on. So in that sense, it's metaphysical. Yeah. But they were making a distinction without a difference, which which is a legal way of thinking of it, which was that. We're not talking about the metaphysical God, meaning the God that theo- theologians speak of. We are talking about the God image archetype, which does exist in the human psyche in every society. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> metaphysics comes from an intellectual point of view. You're, 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 working, you're working from that angle as opposed to the God. The God image is something you have to experience, so you're not really articulating that you're but you're experiencing experiencing everything in the psyche, right? Uh, well, that gets tricky. Yeah. In <laughs> fairness, I mean. Well, yeah, but yeah. No. We'll yeah. stick to young. Okay. Well, let's stick to because in the in this group, my objective is just to explain what Jung was saying. Okay. I'm not taking any position on whether he was right or wrong. Obviously, to me, he was right, and and he's meant a lot to me for the last 30 years, okay? And going back to Women Who Run With The Walls, right? And even before that. But what I have found, and I've been through some difficult times in my life, as everybody goes through, and and Jung acknowledged that everybody goes through them. And so what I found is that I, if I'm in a troubled time for some reason, whatever it is, um, I can pick up any Jungian book and simply start reading and it calms me down. I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's because I've been spent so much time with it, but it always has. I mean, I remember reading Man and His Symbols, which was his book for the layman back in 1990. And I read it three or four pages a night aloud to my wife as we were going to sleep every night. So I'd I'd read and then I'd... Yeah. And and so, so I read it aloud to her. And for three, three or four pages. And it took a year to read the book. And at the end of the year, at least I felt like I had had a year of psychotherapy, Uh, right? And so ever since then, it's always felt like that to me, okay? Yeah, poetry does that for me. Does it? Uh, I'll read read something, and you know, I sort of like go across, throw it in the corner, and then two nights later, I'll pick it up again. And then about the tenth time I'm reading, I'm going, whoa. I'm getting into this now. Last night I read Mercy Street a few times by Anne Sexton. She's 
She's not my favorite, but I, I like that particular quote. You know, Chris, prayers are like that, too. Prayers are like if that. If you know sure. elders and, who and, have and been religion, religious. And religion you, has served. Oh, my goodness. You can talk to elderly people and you just think, wow. Right. What an insight into meditation. Right. And their and, prayers and, that help and them. So, you know? so what Jung said, and Edinger repeated, and Hollis repeated, is that... Um, Previously, we had a religious formula for everything that's psychological. Okay, because think about it. You're, you're an early Iron Age person 2,500 years ago before we had any technology, really, except maybe a good sword. <laughs> and, and, um, and so they're trying to explain something that's happening. They don't know what, but, but their psyche is telling them that there's something happening in the psyche. They don't know it's in the psyche because they're seeing visions and they're having dreams. And if you read the Bible, a lot of things that they're talking about are either dreams or visions, uh -huh. right? Yes. Okay. And, and so what Dr. Jung was saying is, look, all these artistic things going all the way back across humanity can be read from a psychological perspective. Yeah. Okay. And so what they said is, we're not talking about the metaphysical God that theologians talk about. They can say anything they want. We're talking about what we can em empirically, imp what we can empirically say is true in the psyche of modern man. Okay, and therefore we can interpolate and say that this is what was going on in the psyche of these people at this time. And he went all the way back to the earliest writings, the earliest images that people created, and explained it from a psychological point of view. Okay, and so he managed to stay out of trouble with the theologians until he was uh, 56, so until he was 80, okay. Kick him on the way up. Until he was 80, he said, until he was, was 80, he said, I'm just going to do individuals and I'm going to do psychotherapy, right? Yeah. I'm going to do psychotherapy and never mind the rest of you. Okay, but unfortunately, but the point was that the religious aspect had affected him throughout his life. And so when he's 80, he writes Answer to Joe, or in his late 70s, I think. And it's after thinking about it for like 50 years. <laughs> and and so it just came out of him in a rush. I mean, he was he was ill, and he felt he had to do it. And he started to write, and he wrote it in this in this rush. And as soon as he finished, his fever went away. <laughs> right? yeah. That's so relevant. I'm sorry. Yeah, and and so he later said he later said that he would rewrite every one of his books except this one. He he would leave that exactly as it is. Okay, so we're we're just on the cusp of the second half of this book. We basically talked about the Job story, which is where Job is whipping up on. On, uh, or God is whipping up on Job because of a bet with Satan, right? Where the bet was that, that Satan could make Job give up on God. Okay. And God says, no, you can't, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so God lets Satan do everything to Job, whatever he can think of. And, and it doesn't work, and God and Job keeps believing in God, and Job decides to make his case to the good side of God, okay, and, which is actually the non-Satan side of God. <laughs> the non-Satan side of God is the is is the side of God that he would go to 
for reprieve, right? Right. And so finally, what he proved was that he was more moral than Yahweh. Uh, okay. Uh, 